Thank you very much. And let me say how impressed I am. How many people are here on such a snowy, cold night? Uh, you know, I'm sort of used to the snow and cold. I'm from Ann Arbor, so the other side of the state. But we do not get snow like you guys get here. And clearly, everybody's used to it because you're out tonight. And uh, welcome, and thank you for being here. So in the interest of uh, confidentiality and patient privacy, you don't have to answer this question. But I'm just curious, uh, you know, from the crowd, would you say you're in the you know, no vitamin or supplement category? And we could show a show of hands again. If you don't want to, that's perfectly fine. One, two, a few twos, uh, two to five. We have any five to tens? Quite a few five to tens. And greater than ten. Got a, a couple of those as well. So, and this really fits with the what we see across the country, um, exactly what we saw here. The average person is taking, you know, anywhere between one and a half and two and a half supplements or vitamins uh, in addition to their prescription medications. The number of users of greater than 10 vitamins or supplements is increasing dramatically over the past five to 10 years. So vitamins, a booming business. Uh, like I said, one half of Americans are taking a daily vitamin. Uh, annual sales of $23 billion, and that's a big number, and how do I put that in context? I, I think a good way to do that is to compare it to what we're spending on prescription drugs. I'm sure you all are you know, worried about the cost of prescription drugs. Americans are spending about 10% of their total drug cost uh, on vitamins and supplements, and so I think it's really important. That's a significant chunk of our expenditures to know what kind of benefit we're getting from it. Uh, how, is, how are these medications helping me? So why are we taking these medications? Well, lots of reasons I hear in my clinic. My doctor told me to. Uh, I want to live longer, certainly. I want to feel better because I take my vitamins. Uh, the TV, the radio, the internet, everywhere nowadays you're hearing ads, claims, uh, with you know, various degrees of uh, you know, accuracy about the you know, effects of vitamins and minerals. We get it better this time. Okay. So my goals for you tonight are when you leave, you feel like I have a framework, I have a way I can really evaluate each pill that goes in my body. Now, again, I'm not talking at all about your prescription medications. Those are, I think, best evaluated between you and your physician. Uh, but the non-prescription vitamins and supplements are what I want to focus on. I want to understand, have you understand why you're taking it. And there are a lot of different reasons why you may take it. Uh, and we'll sort of highlight an approach to that. And I want to review the science, or in some cases, the lack uh, of science uh, behind some of these vitamins and supplements that we're putting into our body. Good. I want to identify those vitamins and supplements that clearly have well-proven benefit uh, for specific conditions. Uh, I also, and this is, I think, one of the most important parts of this talk, want to identify those vitamins and supplements which are potentially harmful for you. Uh, and I want you to leave confident when you look at your pill box when you get home that every pill that you put into your pill box is potentially benefiting you. So a little background uh, on vitamins and supplements. Uh, where did it come from? Where's the word vitamins from? Uh, vital amines. Initially, in the early 1900s, they thought amines, which are an organic compound, a part of our body, were the essential ingredient, and it became a vital amine. That got shortened to vitamin, uh, as we know it today. And there are many, many examples of historical deficiencies in vitamins. If you were alive in 1900, and I don't think anybody here was, uh, vitamin deficiencies would have been a much, much bigger deal. Uh, this would have been something that was very common, uh, potentially, you know, 20, 30 percent of the population suffering some clear vitamin deficiency. You may have heard of scurvy with pirates and sailors uh, in the, you know, 16 and 1700s. Uh, they knew if they tried to sail from Europe all the way across the Atlantic uh, that there was the potential that they could have bleeding gums, strange rashes over their body. Nobody quite knew why this was happening to sailors, especially those who were out for long times at sea. Somebody decided, well, what if we increase the vegetables? We bring some fresh fruit on board. Suddenly, this went away. It took many, many years for them to figure out exactly what it was in those fresh fruits, specifically the vitamin C that prevented the scurvy, 
This was an example where we, we finally started to learn that there are some key ingredients that our body can't make. We have to take in. We knew that we had to take in food and calories in order to survive, but we didn't realize there were very specific compounds that our body could not live without. Another example that is now incredibly rare is rickets. Uh, when children were vitamin D deficient, uh, they would develop abnormalities in the rapidly growing bones, such as the skull and the long limbs. Again, extremely rare at this point in time. So what have we done to get rid of these vitamin deficiencies? What's different now as compared to 1900? Well, certainly our diet is different. Our lifestyles are different. Life is certainly much easier uh, than it was in 1900. Uh, access to good food is much you know, more common than it was in 1900. Uh, our food also is now fortified. Uh, you often see fortified with such and such, fortified with this. You may see that on your breads, on a lot of different uh, things in the grocery store. Some specific examples. So salt is now fortified with iodine. Uh, milk, you often see vitamin D in your milk. Uh, flour, all kinds of things in flour. Uh, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, some of the B vitamins, uh, even iron in your flour. So we are getting a lot of these essential vitamins and minerals in our diet, more so than people were even you know, 50 or 60 years ago. I think this is an important graph to think about for a little while. Uh, in the blue, you see vitamin use. And you can see in 1900, nobody was taking vitamins. They weren't around. We didn't even know about some of these things. Uh, and then you can see in red, the incidence of vitamin deficiency. As I mentioned previously, it was quite common in 1900 for people to be vitamin deficient. What I really want to point out is how when we started fortifying food, when life started changing, post-war, when diet started improving, you can see vitamin deficiencies came way down. Also note that vitamin supplement use had not yet gone up. Uh, most of these significant deficiencies were actually gone uh, by the 50s, 60s, and 70s before really it ramped up uh, the use of over-the-counter vitamins and supplements, especially over the last 20 years. So, What's happened over the last 20 years? Why do we have two, three, four, ten 10 vitamins in our pill box at this point in time? Improved health literacy. This is a great example of improved health literacy. You guys are all here. I suspect if I gave this same lecture 30 years ago, it may have been incredibly hard to get a crowd like this in the middle of a snowstorm. We're worried about what's going on with our bodies. We want to do everything we can to keep ourselves healthy. And that's part of the reason for the use of these vitamins and supplements. Aging population. There's more of us uh, older than 50 at this point in time than you know, any point in the past. Uh, it's a larger population, and it's also a much healthier population. <laughs> Again, the example I see right in front of myself are a lot of people who are later in life but extremely vibrant, extremely healthy, and living active, you know, enjoyable lifestyles, and you want to continue that. And certainly, vitamins and supplements offer one option to try to continue that life for as long as possible. Strong marketing, certainly. Uh, you really can't you know, watch TV for an extended period of time, flip through a magazine uh, without seeing some claim for some new vitamin, some new supplement, uh, again, with various degrees of accuracy. So who is using vitamins? Well, we know that women tend to use more vitamins than men. Uh, higher education levels uh, seem to correlate with increased vitamin use. Uh, higher income levels seem to correlate with increased vitamin use. And ironically, those who are already the most healthy, those who are already exercising, those who are already eating right, those who are already probably getting everything they need in their diet happen to be the ones who are most likely to take vitamins and supplements as well. Who isn't taking any vitamins and supplements? Unfortunately, it's those people who need it the most. There are certainly still populations in our country uh, and certainly populations around the world that could benefit uh, from vitamins and supplements. Even a multivitamin could be potentially life-changing for certain populations, less so in our country, uh, but certainly around the world. Those who truly need it most are are least likely to be taking a vitamin or supplement, which is really unfortunate. So 
I've given you some background, and what I want to do tonight is sort of break down why you might take what you're taking and allow you to go home and analyze each pill that you're taking. So there are a few key, key reasons. Perhaps there is good, sound medical evidence that the vitamin or supplement that you're taking improves health. Perhaps there's not good, sound medical evidence. And as I'm going to discuss, in a lot of cases, there isn't. A completely different reason to take your vitamin or supplement is what it does for you. You are different than your neighbor. You may react completely differently to that vitamin or supplement. And the effect it has on you, in my opinion, is equally as important as what the medical literature may claim about that vitamin or mineral. Another key point, I want you to know about the possible harms. They're fairly uncommon, but there's some key ones I'm going to highlight that really would be a pretty good reason to take that pill out of your pill box. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about cost trade-offs. If some of you are using greater than 10 supplements and vitamins a day, there's a significant cost to that. Uh, you know, I went through the vitamin store the other day just to look at the cost of some of these bottles. And people can be spending hundreds of dollars even a month uh, on their vitamins and supplements. And certainly there is a, a trade-off. So what else could be done with that money? Specifically, what else could be done with that money for your health? Uh, could you join a gym? Could you invest in a new bike? Or a lot of different things. And it's, it's you know, weighing the balances. Maybe you're better off by spending that money some other way. So the first category for us to analyze what's in your pill box. What does the medical literature say? And we as physicians are certainly guilty of focusing on prescription drugs more so than the vitamins and supplements uh, that you may be using. The vast majority of our studies are analyzing new prescription medications, and there's a lot less funding to look at these vitamins and supplements. You may ask, well, why is that? Well, the majority of our prescription drugs are made by pharmaceutical companies. They have deep pockets, and they can fund this research extensively, and so we have a lot more information. Now your vitamin B or your vitamin C, you can get that anywhere. It's made by a lot of generic companies. None of these companies are going to have the money to invest in extensive research on some of these chemicals. What is out there is important to you know, look at closely in terms of the quality of the research. So I want to talk about something that's you know, a buzzword for physicians, but you may not have heard before. And it's a buzzword that I'd like you to think about when you hear the latest story on a new vitamin on the news. And that's a peer-reviewed, randomized, controlled trial. It's a big, long term. These are the studies in you know, very popular, highly respected journals that you may hear, like the New England Journal of Medicine. Can I still be heard in the back fairly well? OK. I'm just going to shout. Just tell me if I'm too loud now. These are trials that are generally done by groups of hundreds of physicians. And they are analyzed often by hundreds of other physicians and carefully scrutinized. They're usually involving thousands of patients so that we can correct for the variation between you and your neighbor. As I mentioned, you may react completely differently to that vitamin. And so in order to really understand if a vitamin is good for a whole population, we need to study thousands and thousands of people. It often will compare your vitamin to a placebo pill. If I gave this half of the room a vitamin, and this half of the room knew they were not getting a vitamin, and I brought you back a month later and asked if this side felt better, they very well may feel better. But how do I know if it truly was the vitamin? Because they knew they were getting it the whole time. These trials will often use a placebo pill, a sugar pill, uh, so that people don't know what they're getting. They don't know if they're putting the vitamin into their body. And it allows us to correct for the chance that people just feel good because they're taking another pill. 